Hello, folks. Welcome back to Scarborough. This is episode seven, the bearded one. Uh, good to have you back. Today, we're going to be talking about a couple of different revolutionaries in their own fields. Uh, the bad on the bad team this week, we have Taylor Swift, and on the good team, uh, I will be defending Fidel Castro. That's right. Well, that's it's that kind of show. That's where we're at at Black Magic TV. I don't know. Uh, we're we're going to defend Castro here. Um, I have decided. This comes from up top. I don't know. The views and opinions expressed on Scarborough are those of solely Aaron Scarborough, not Black Magic TV. Uh, let's get right into it. I, I have an interesting quote from, uh, Mark Twain from the time of, uh, well, the year 1900. And, uh, it's, it's interesting because I find that patriotic boomers probably love Mark Twain. And he was also himself a patriot for most of his life. Although in the year 1900, he had a major change of heart with what was going on in the Spanish American war also involving Cuba, like our hero today, Fidel Castro. Um, but this is in a specific response to the war in the Philippines, um, which at the time America was undergoing the project of, uh, you know, they were siding with, uh, Cuba to liberate them from imperialism, uh, and that is, uh, you know, the the influence of the Spanish. They drove out the Spanish, helped Cuba drive out the Spanish, and uh, rather than just take hold of Cuba, um, uh, and and you know, colonizing it, making it uh, a part of the United States, they sunk their claws in in other ways, and. Uh, this, this quote from Mark Twain is kind of addressing what was going on in these times. Um, so this is from the New York Herald, October 15th, 1900. Uh, Mark Twain says, I left these shores at Vancouver a red-hot imperialist. I wanted the American Eagle to go screaming into the Pacific. It seemed tiresome and tame for it to content itself with the Rockies. Why not spread its wings over the Philippines, I asked myself, and I thought it would be a real good thing to do. Um, I said to myself, here are a people who have suffered for three centuries. We can make them as free as ourselves, give them a government in a country of their own, put a miniature of the American Constitution afloat in the Pacific, start a brand new uh, republic, and take its place amongst the free nations of the world. It seemed to me a great task uh, uh, to which we had addressed ourselves. Um but I have thought some more since then, and I have read carefully the Treaty of Paris, and I have seen that we do not intend to free, but to subjugate the people of the Philippines. We have gone there to conquer, not to redeem. It should, it seems to me, be our pleasure and duty to make those people free and let them deal with their own domestic questions in their own way. And so I am an anti-imperialist. I am opposed to having the eagle put its talons on any other land. That's coming from Mark Twain, folks. Mark Twain, American writer. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about our boy, Fidel Castro. Aside from the obvious, uh, a great aesthetic on that man, uh, a great beard. He was tall. He was athletic. He was a man of the people. Um, he was born to a well-off family. Uh, he became a lawyer. He was an educated man. Um, but he dedicated his life uh, early on as a young man to the problems of the lower classes in Cuba, the ones that were being subjugated to uh, basically slave labor. There were people living on plantations, getting paid next to nothing, and you had these basically like feudal lords – um, Cubans, many of them who would later be exiled after the revolution, who ran uh, uh, plantations 
um, uh, you know, uh, harvesting sugarcane a lot. We, in the United States, we developed a whole economy and a whole way of life around sugar because we had this new convenient um, slave colony in Cuba. Uh, you know, after the Spanish were driven out, it basically um, was in 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 that little country. Um, it was uh, just kind of a series of dictator after dictator. Um, and Fidel came around when at a time when the Cuban people had just really had enough. Um, they, uh, they were dealing with um, a government rule that would later be known as uh, gangsterismo. Um, rule by gangster. There was much United States uh, meddling in their economy, and uh, we basically just used them to get sugar made for free, and we made a very select few people rich in Cuba, and as a result, um, things were horrible. And Fidel Castro came along, and he, along with uh, um, other revolutionaries, um, took up arms. They started small, and they built a resistance of um, freedom fighters that uh, attacked the government, the U.S.-backed government, by the way, um, uh, you know, constantly. And they, today, we would call them terrorists. Uh, but the the Cuban people, um, uh, you know, depending on where their allegiances lie. There's a lot of Cuban Americans who are descended from uh, the slave owners, and they were, um, you know, they were exiled. They were persecuted. Um, but let's be honest, most of those people uh, are de not descended from the people that uh, Fidel Castro liberated. Um, a lot of things uh, come up when you bring up the name Fidel Castro. People uh, talk about um, totalitarianism. They bring up the word communism. Um, you know, uh, all these fun concepts. Um, but what they conveniently leave out every time when it comes to starvation in, in Cuba and uh, all sorts of other problems that those people experience... Um, they leave out uh, American intervention and the role that that has had to play in all of that. Uh, in the 1960s, um, uh, freshly after uh, the revolution, um, Cuba was making great progress. Um, they were struggling, of course. They were a newly liberated country. Um, and there were people that were not happy about it. And a lot of those people, the United States either directly aided, uh, funded, trained. Um, there were immediately, without any gap, there were um, acts of uh, meddling, uh, assassination plots. Um, all throughout the, the early 60s, you had the Bay of Pigs invasion. Uh, which, of course, is where um, Kennedy's administration secretly trained a group of Cuban exiles to, uh, you know, uh, go back to Cuba and uh, and launch an invasion uh, sneakily. And it, of course, famously was uh, not a successful mission. It was one of the biggest disasters, biggest embarrassments of uh, the Kennedy administration. And um, at that point, Fidel Castro, despite uh, uh, having the United States do everything in its power to um, get him uh, killed, uh, he had not declared himself a socialist uh, or the, the Cuban government to be a socialist government. He had not um, officially uh, paired with uh, the Soviet Union. And that was the turning point. Uh, Fidel Castro, because of American meddling, um, was fully justified in saying, you know what, fuck you guys. Um, you guys have been fucking with my people and my government uh, and my, um, you've been, you know, you have exploited us long enough. We are socialists. Fuck you. And uh, 
the rest is history. The United States, of course, did not let up. You had the Cuban Missile Crisis shortly after that, uh, where huma humanity almost ended, uh, came very close to ending. Um, yeah, which that that's another thing where people have a, a distorted view of it, uh, it much like Pearl Harbor, um, where it's it, it's like these people. Um, I, th I think that they, on, on some level, they remember it wrong, or maybe it's just like taught in schools wrong, but uh, the whole story behind the Cuban Missile Crisis, as I understand it, is that um, the United States had missiles in Turkey, I believe. They had them all around the Soviet Union and uh, all around Russia, pointed towards Russia, so to speak. Uh, ready to go at a minute's notice, and um, uh, the the Soviet government, um, led by Nikita Khrushchev, I, I don't even know how to say it, but he put missiles in Cuba pointed at the United States, and it almost came to blows. Um, and you know, as a result of it, uh, I, I don't know, people perceive it in different ways, but I see it as a good example of Fidel Castro standing strong um, and saying, no, you don't fuck with us, The uh, you know, um, and it resulted in the United States backing off in certain areas. So, um, yeah, so... so if you look into Castro, and I hope that you do, please look this stuff this stuff up and prove me wrong with it. I I, I beg of you. Um, but uh, yeah, people uh, have a lot of convenient facts that they just fail to mention when they talk about the problems of Cuba, the problems of Castro, and uh, we don't like that. Um, so. Uh, we've endorsed Fidel Castro officially on Scarborough. Uh, not perfect. No one is, you know. Um, but overall, better than any U.S. president since then, for sure. Um, let's see here. So, uh, next on the docket, we have uh, Taylor Swift, um, which is a touchy subject uh, because... Part of the, the Taylor Swift story and one of the um, one of the more impressive ways that she's been able to hoodwink um, uh, so many American women mainly, um, she somehow has controlled the narrative of her success, her story, and painted it in a way where she always comes off as the good guy. Um, she, uh, rather than, you know, if we saw someone else, like, uh, similarly um, start up a, a business and grow it to what she has become. Um, I think most rational people uh, would be grossed out by it. I know I am grossed out by it, and I know that's sacrilege to people who just appreciate, like, good business and love Elon Musk and whatever the fuck you're into, but I am one of those guys. I don't believe that anyone should have that much money. I think it's fucking absurd. I think as an artist, I, uh, I just I cannot imagine being at that level of just kind of— ego and greed to where you think you need that much power and influence over people um when i don't know who her heroes are musically but when i hear her music i don't um i don't hear it the way that others do i think that women hear taylor swift and it, it it, uh, it provides them with some very human experience and, and some level of sharing in heartbreak, and it's very relatable. Um, she's very good at presenting herself in social media. She's savvy. And I, uh, I kind of get this from I, – I, I'm a big fan of the Tim Dillon show, and he puts stuff like this very well. But he has always said that – 
people who are that savvy at social media, it, they create a red flag for me. And I feel that way about her music. I don't feel like it's on the same level as a, you know, a musician who just fucking struggles uh, and, and, and makes art like during a time in their life where they can't pay their bills. And um, I, I just, I don't get any of that. I need that from my music. And she's not a testament of that. She's a testament of creating algorithm-friendly, um, you know, not too bold music um, that, you know, she tries, she's done a great job of, like, expanding to, like, she started saying fuck in her songs and whatnot. Bravo. How brave. Um, but she's at a level where she is, to me, she's no different than, uh, she's like Jeff Bezos or something. It's like, I, is that really what I'm going to be a fan of? Is that what, am I going to start watching sports because I like the rich vampiric fucking real estate dynasty families that own the goddamn sports teams? You know, am I going to start, uh, uh, worshiping the fucking Hunt family or whoever owns the Chiefs. Is that what we're doing now? Are we just are we just excited? Like, are our new heroes these fucking dork ass tech startups who just all they are good at is just manipulating people for profit? That's all they do, and it's really it's about that. If you examine this shit from uh. Uh, that lens, you're going to end up realizing fucking Taylor Swift is not Bob Dylan. She's not fucking, um, she's not Neil Young in his hay. He's a dick now, but he used to be cool. Bruce Springsteen also used to be very cool. You used to hear great class politics in a Bruce Springsteen song. Now he does podcasts with Obama. Um, I don't know. Anyways. I just don't, with Taylor Swift, I just don't trust it. And um, I know so many people that fucking, they really get mad when I say stuff about her like that. But she is not a feminist icon. What are you doing? You know, she uh, she's not a revolutionary. She's Jeff Bezos. That's, that's, that's who she is. Um. I don't know. Maybe I just have a problem with pop music in general, which I, I don't think I do. I, because I, I, I don't know. I, I just don't know. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I, uh, I also think, you know, there's a lot of talk about Taylor Swift. Uh, you know, the the Super Bowl hasn't happened yet. I don't know when this episode's going to air exactly, but uh, there's a lot of speculation about her role in the upcoming election, which, I, I mean, people, I, I hear a lot of, like, right-wing conspiracies about that, which is kind of ridiculous. Like, I think that, I don't know, if you still think that, uh, uh, Joe Biden is coming from any sort of action, like left or even liberal ideology. You're wrong. He's a fucking crook. Uh, um, and you know, she, you're right. Like she does have the power to sway people's opinions about this stuff. And, uh, I'm sure that when the time comes, this always happens when the establishment decides that it needs to sell something like Joe Biden the last time. They enlist the help of Lady Gaga and everyone, anyone else who centrist, rich, white, suburban liberals look up to. And I could see her endorsing Joe Biden. Um I don't know. I'm just like, why? You could be like, and I fucking hate his music, but you could be like Bob Marley, you know? You could be a revolutionary. Um, but instead, they choose not to uh, because that's not what it's about. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, when you're on Taylor Swift's level, like if if the CIA isn't funding you, they, they're definitely enjoying... Uh, the impact that you have um, because uh, Taylor Swift has become the narrative about her is like, yeah, she fought the power. She fought the record labels. Um, 
which, by the way, these are record labels that are enormous anyway. They're already corrupt. She was in the fucking country music industry. Um, I mean, uh, what a lame thing to be into. Why be into that at this point? I understand. I listen to things uh, ironically sometimes, and I like popular things sometimes, you know? But, my God, why, um, Taylor Swift is a fake image, uh, an image that is supposed to reinforce your belief in the fucking American dream, um, uh, from a very neoliberal, uh, you know, fake feminist perspective, um, and it's, it's very safe and good for the algorithm, but, it ain't art with an, with a capital A, all right? She ain't Towns Van Zandt. Um, say his name, everyone. Towns Van Zandt. Listen to him. The tortured cowboy. Junkie. That's music. Towns Van Zandt. Not Taylor Swift. Um, anyways, whatever. Uh, I'll see you guys next week. I'm Aaron Scarborough. Whatever. <clears throat> hey, thanks for watching. If you liked what you saw... Hit the like and subscribe buttons and check out one of these other videos. We'll see you next time.